Just slide up. Every couple of years I preach a message with this title. Are you on the right bus? I don't preach the same message, but I preach the same title. Where I usually start from is um, when I was, uh, I was brought up in uh, Sydney, but then to go to university, I, I had to go to Newcastle University. I was not familiar with the setup of Newcastle and what suburbs were there, where. And so when I uh, travelled up by, by train and got out and then uh, shown where the buses were and went over there and then I, I couldn't work out how to get from where I was to where the university is. If you uh, know Newcastle at all, the university is, is sort of way out west. It's, uh, when I say way out west, it's like the uh, western, western part of, uh, or what was the western part, it's probably now not quite that far out because Newcastle has extended so much. New Newcastle is now something like 400,000 people. It is quite, ex quite extraordinary in um, size. But uh, someone had, had said, find a bus that says, um, probably it had Wars End via Mayfield on the, on the front. So I, I waited until a, a bus came with that and then I asked for a, a ticket to the university. And uh, a whole lot of people got on the uh, bus and I'm, I'm just sort of watching because I don't know what the university looks like. Then uh, we came to this very imposing, very large, massive uh, building. And then I noticed about three quarters, four fifths of the people on the bus got off there. For this, this must be it. So I, I just joined the queue getting off the bus and I just stepped down onto the pavement and the uh, bus driver calls out, Hey mate, weren't you going to Newcastle University? I said, yeah, he said, this isn't it. So I hop, hop back up. Uh, this was what they used to call the Newcastle Tech College at Pies Hill, if you know that area. But um, the uh, university was as, as much distance further as it was from where I started to where I got out there. And then when I finally reached it, the, uh, uh, there are very few people left on, on the bus and the driver turned around and said, here it is, mate. So I got out there and I, I, I realized how easy you can be on the wrong bus. How easy you can think you're going to one place, how easy you can get a wrong destination. So, I am in, as the leader of this church, the second last phase of ministry. The last phase of ministry that I'll be in as the leader of this church will be the uh, succession time when uh, on, on my retirement someone else comes in. We will not be doing that succession as it perhaps happens in a lot of denominational churches where one person stands down, the other one comes in. What I will be doing is we'll be having an, an overlap time. A, a time when I continue as the leader and the, the uh, person who is going to become the leader will be, uh, will be in the church at the, at the same time. So we're now in the phase before that phase. And I want this phase, this second last phase, to really count. I don't want this second last phase to be just like business as usual. I, I want to know that, that when I come to the end of this phase, that things will be different. And so, as I, I think we're in the very early stages of the second last phase, so I want you to know where this bus is going. I want you to know what's up on the front, so it's very, very clear to you. I want you to think through, is this where I want to go? I uh, will do everything, I, I'll do absolutely everything to convince you to stay on the bus. I'll do everything to convince you that this is where we need to go. But you know, ultimately, it, it, it comes down to, is this where you want to go? And you've got to really think that through, because, because this is the direction that, that is very much on my heart for this faint. When I was doing studies on the uh, book of Ephesians recently that had just gone up recently onto our, uh, our website, I found that there were uh, six major ways that Paul talks about the church. He talks about the church as called out ones, as a body, as a family, as a temple, as a bride. And then the last one, he talks about the church as an army. And it's always been the last one that's really kind of gotten hold of me in a, in a, in a stronger way. And I want to use the final picture of the church as an army. And I do believe with all my heart that the, the only way that we as a church will be able to fulfill all that God has called us to do will be by following or embracing three principles, three elements. Number one, that we will have a common purpose. Number two, that we'll be a people who are practicing spiritual disciplines. 
Number three, that we'll be a people who are serving others as part of a team. So what, what I want to do this morning, I want to give just a, 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 a sort of broad brush, broad stroke picture of each of these three. So let's look at the first one, having a common purpose. I was watching a documentary recently on the Vietnam War and on Australia's part in it. I tried to buy the documentary, but the blood is more than $100. And I don't think it's worth buying it for an hour and a half documentary. So please, no one say, I'm going to give you the money. I still I give it back and say, no, I don't think it's worth it. But it was an amazing documentary because it brought out how different the Australians were in Vietnam to the Americans. And one of the things they talked about was when the Australian base was set up at Nguyen the Australians decided, even though there were, I think, two small villages who were in that area that actually had to be moved, and the Australians helped the uh, villagers move and uh, found the, uh, the, the better site for them and, and, and worked in with them. And the Australian soldiers continued to work in with the, with the people. So they actually won the hearts of the Vietnamese who were part of the area in which they worked. The Americans didn't see the need, even though there are uh, lots of um, uh, photographs of, that seem to be showing Americans working in with the people. It seemed that whenever there was a photo shot, they worked in with the people. And when the photographers were not there, it appears they didn't work in nearly as closely. But the Australians did. The Australians kept working in with the Vietnamese because they wanted to win their hearts. They wanted to win their hearts and they uh, wanted to know that if there's any kind of in insurgency that those in the area would not turn on them. And the Australians did that very, very successfully. So, as I think about and using this kind of model, I'm thinking what is our common purpose? And I put it into four statements. Number one, we live in a land that isn't our home. You agree? Heaven is our hope. We have scriptures that talk about our citizenship is in heaven and not here on earth. Philippians 3.20 So this world, this land is not our home. But where we are here on earth, we are surrounded by people who don't follow our God. We're surrounded by people. They don't follow our God. So what has God done? God has placed us here to win their hearts. That's why he's put us here. He's put us here to win the hearts of those who are around us. Part of that, our ultimate purpose, is to see those people who are living around us become full disciples of Christ. Amen. That's what God has put us here for. So there's four things. I'll go through them again. We live in a land that is not our home. We're surrounded by people who don't follow our God. God has placed us here to win their hearts our ultimate purpose is to see those people become full disciples of Christ. So as I look at that, in that plan, the local church, the local church, what, what we are here, the local church is a base, like, like an army base, where Christ's soldiers are two things. One, they are discipled themselves, and two, they are trained to win and disciple others. The purpose of the church is to is to try is to disciple those who are in the church and then those who who as they are discipled to train them to win and to disciple others you'd be very familiar with the scripture from uh, matthew 28 then jesus came to them and said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So Jesus said what he's ultimately after are disciples. And so if we were to have an amazing influx of people coming to Christ, but they never became disciples, as wonderful as that would be, if they never became disciples, we would fall short of our ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose of the church is to disciple those who are the Christians who are there and then train them to win and then disciple others. So the success of any church can be measured by these two clear things. So let me ask you, 
Can you lead someone to Christ and then disciple them? I don't know how many years I had been in church life till I began to think through how well could I lead someone to Christ and then having led them to, to Christ, how well could I disciple them? And you know, it concerned me. It concerned me that having been in a Pentecostal church for a, a little period of time and having been baptized in the Holy Spirit and having before that been a, been a, been a, been a Christian, though not in, a, uh, not in a church life too much, but, but for all these things, uh, and, and even having been baptized in the Holy Spirit, up to that point, I had never led someone to Christ. And I'd, I'd never worked in with people to actually disciple them in some way. Now, I did have the opportunity, and then I did find that, that uh, through things that were shared, people were one to Christ. But you know, it, it just struck me that, that for my time in a Pentecostal church, had I gotten hold of these basic things, could I lead someone to Christ? And then, having led them to Christ, could I adequately disciple them? Because the longer we're in church life, the more we should be able to say yes to both. Now, I recognize that, that different ones have a stronger evangelistic gifting. I know that. But I also see biblically, and, and Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians, that every Christian is given the ministry of reconciliation. So we're all, we're all called to share the gospel in some way with those around us. So, so I, I ask, can you lead someone to Christ? And then can you disciple them? Let me ask you this, if, if their life, the one that you disciple, was just like yours, would they be a passionate follower of Christ? Now think about it. Think about yourself. Think about the life that you live. Think about if someone that you led to Christ copied your life, what would they look like? They'd look like you. Is that good? Do you want them to look like you? I don't mean facially. I don't mean some endomorphic thing. I'm, I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about <coughs> the kind of life they live. <coughs> talking about the way they talk. Talking about how they treat others. Talking about their, their discipline. Talking about a whole lot of different areas. Can you lead someone to Christ and can you disciple them? So can you see that in this, this, this second to last phase of my, my ministry, here, as the leader of this church, this is the direction I want to be a little bit more intentional with. I don't mean that every message is going to be down exactly the, the same track. That, that, that won't, won't be the case. But, but I am saying that, that unless we can do these very basic things, then I think we are really going to miss out something. So, for the local church, if it's to be a base where we are disciple, trained to, to win and disciple others, First thing that is a necessity is we have a common purpose. Now the second thing is that we practice spiritual disciplines. How many love the word discipline? How many of you in, in the high school, the only time you ever knew about discipline was when you got, well, boys, when you got cane. Girls, girls never got cane, did, did they? How many, how many guys got done cane? in uh, high school. Numerous times. <laughs> you would love it when the teacher would literally walk in with a duster in one hand and a cane over his shoulder. And, and you, you knew he was trigger happy. And if you did, now this doesn't happen Karen anymore. <laughs> but if you did or you said anything, the only understanding you had of the word discipline was, was, was what would happen. And you know guys, we used to try to try to get the tip of our fingers as hot as possible because someone told us that if you if the tip of your fingers were really hot it didn't didn't hurt as much. I don't think that was true because it hurt just as much. And you and you try to drop your hand and then you put the cane underneath and push it up again and then whack you just as hard. Hands up again, those who got cane. I see the tears welling up in your eyes right now. But there's another use of the word discipline. And it wasn't just uh, the, the, uh, the like penalty for doing something wrong. It was a, a, a way of living. It was, it was putting a structure into our life. And, and there, are, there are spiritual disciplines, biblical disciplines, 
that the Lord Jesus wants worked into our life. And I, I'm just taking, there are these 10 uh, I see that the Lord Jesus related to discipleship. I'm just going to mention four of them. Uh, the Lord Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. So let me ask you, if you disciple someone, you want them to, to, to Christ, you were discipling them. And their life in the scripture, their discipline in the scripture, paralleled yours. In fact, it reflected yours. They didn't read the Bible any more than you read. They didn't read it any less than you read it. They didn't apply it any more than you do or any less than you do. But they applied it the same way you do. Would they come out as a passionate follower of Christ? See, this is a spiritual discipline that to me is just absolutely basic. A second one. The Lord Jesus said, if you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So again, a second one here, prayer. If the person that you were discipling, if they became a carbon copy of you in terms of their prayer life, what kind of prayer life would they have? Would they have a strong prayer life? Would they have a mediocre prayer life? Would they have a disappearing prayer life? What kind of prayer life would they have? Remember, they are copying you. The Lord Jesus was quite happy for the disciples to copy him. What about the third one? Jesus said, if any of you does not give up everything he has, cannot be my disciple. So, if you disciple someone and they were as generous as you are, they, were, they would give away things as easily as you give away. They would hold on to material possessions either as tightly or as lightly as you hold on to them. What would they look like? If they copied you, if they reflected you, would they have a generous lifestyle? Would they be disciplined with their, with their money? How would they do that if they were, they were copying you? What would they spend their money on? What do you spend your money on? They're copying you. So if you're going to be a disciple of Christ and, and, and you're going to win people and you're going to see them discipled into, into the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ and they're copying you in this area, how tightly do you hold on to your, to your comfort? Now we live fairly comfortably, don't we? Yes. We really do. I know I've told this story, but only, I don't know, it's probably six, nine months back, I think I was walking up to... Um, uh, ultra tune opposite the Valfair to get our car that was being serviced and I'm just walking out the front and as clear as a bell I, I hear these words in my head you're pretty comfortable aren't you and I'm thinking what and I'm walking along thinking yeah I guess I'm pretty comfortable and that was it nothing more I'd love to say I had this wonderful conversation with the Holy Spirit. I didn't. I just had these, these words. You're pretty comfortable, aren't you? And it struck me that it was like a challenge. Am I too comfortable? Am I too comfortable? Now, I mean, there are all... I guess we, 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 we're all different. And for different ones of us, there are different things to, to make us uncomfortable. For some of us, it doesn't take much to make us uncomfortable. For others, it takes a lot to make us uncomfortable. But it, it just struck me so very, very clearly. And I, I had to do think through. Am I willing, as a disciple of Christ, to give up everything? The next one, I'm, gonna, I'm only doing four of these. Jesus said, anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And so I began to just um, think about this. If I disciple someone, they become like me. To what extent are they willing to die to themselves? To what extent are they willing to die to selfishness? How many have heard of Scott Peck? All right, Scott Peck, uh, uh, he's uh, died now, but a uh, leading psychiatrist in his day and came out with uh, a number of books that were able to, to uh, cross the, uh, into the, the sort of sold in millions and millions and millions. And um, one of the many, many amazing things he said, he said, we are all born, now I always, I don't pronounce this word properly, but he said, we are all born narcissists. 
Have I said it rightly? Yes. Completely and utterly self-centered. We are born this way. We are born this way. So he said, like, like all of God's working is, is to then turn us around from doing things that simply suit us. Sometimes even working in with the others. It's all right, we're working with others as long as I'm the kingpin. And it's still, I have to be the boss. It's still, I have to be in control. And, and so, so I'm thinking if, if I disable someone and they become like, like me, to what extent will they carry their own cross? All right, so, so what I've said, for the local church to be a base where we are discipled, trained to win and disciple others, there are three things that we are looking at. Having a common purpose, we talked about the second one just then, uh, practicing spiritual disciplines. Let's come to the third one, to be serving others, ministering as part of a team. Now, I can still remember the day when my firstborn son, some of you would know when uh, Cameron was a younger guy, a little, little tiny chap, he had a shock of pure white hair. He um, shaves his head now, but he had an absolute shock of white hair. I don't know what age he was. You know how like mums remember these things perfectly, but like, you know, dad's done. He was somewhere around two. He mightn't have been uh, two. And, and, uh, but there was sort of a growing ability to, to hear what you say and understand what you say. And I remember sort of thinking, I wonder, I need to, to get something from another room. And I just remember he's just with his shock of white hair, uh, nothing on top, just wearing a white nappy. And I, I just said to him, I said, Cameron, can you get whatever the thing was? I don't remember. For Daddy? And he thought for a moment, turned around, ran into the room, and picked it up and brought it back for me. And it was the first time, the first time, and I don't know if I said it out loud or heard, thought it in my head, but the words were there. The tide is beginning to turn. <laughs> because, because up to a certain point in time, with, uh, with, with, with babies, I mean, they give you back giggles and, and, and smiles and... I'm trying to think of the good things they give back. Um, I mean, they, they give this back to you, but there comes a time where, where, where it's like, like you're pouring into them, pouring into them, pouring into them, pouring into them, and then they reach an age where they begin to give something more back, apart from just like smiles and giggles and, and nappies and stuff and you know, all that stuff. But, but they, 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 there's a turning around. And the same thing happens with us as Christians. Same sort of thing happens to us. Up until, like, like or virtually from the, the time we are born again, God makes us capable of giving to others, helping others. And the, the, uh, the word ministry is exactly the same word for serving. So uh, ministry is just an avenue in which I serve others. And I serve others. So any time I think of ministry as something that centers in me, I'm actually defying the definition. Because ministry is actually serving others, it's blessing others, it's building up others all the time, all the time. So as we grow in Christ, the ability to minister or to serve others should grow also. But what I see is in the New Testament, serving others, ministry, was invariably done in teams. In teams. And we have this thought in our mind that, that ministry is when I'm out there doing this and I'm out there doing that. And then we come back to the New Testament and we see that there's hardly any one person out there doing this, one person out there doing that. I think of the Lord Jesus' ministry where he said, and he said numerous times, the Son can do nothing, nothing of himself. He only does the things he sees the Father doing. He only speaks the words he hears the Father speaking. And he does it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's a Father, Son, and Spirit ministry. So everything Jesus did, he did as part of a team. He did nothing as an individual in that sense. Nothing. And then, of course, when he, he raised up disciples, all 
they did. They did as a team. Uh, we think about the Apostle Paul and we uh, think about the, um, uh, we read in the book of Acts that Paul went out here and Paul did this and Paul did that. But if you read the Acts of the Apostles carefully, you find that first of all on the first missionary journey, it's Paul and Barnabas coming out. And, and, and then you, you're reading through the various journeys and then at one point you find that the writer begins to use the word we meaning that even the writer Luke had joined them. And then when you're reading Paul's letters that he writes while in the missionary journeys, he talks about, I'm sending to you, and then he'll talk about Timothy or Titus, or, or he'll, he'll talk about those who are traveling with him. Now, Acts hasn't talked about them. So Paul, even the great apostle Paul, traveled in team ministry. Everything that he could do. There would have been times he was by himself, but it was team ministry. Alright, see, a growing problem. Now, uh, the uh, picture we have here is uh, Paul writing letters, and, and he, has, he has someone else who's working in with him. Um, and uh, in fact, m many times, in most of Paul's letters, Paul didn't actually write. Someone else did the physical writing, and Paul dictated them. And, and that's why we, people argue back and forth today in more academic circles whether Paul wrote them because it didn't quite seem his style. Well, you've, you've got someone else picking up. You know how like um, um, if you're a, uh, you're a, um, uh, a secretary and, and your boss gives you a letter and they, they have bad syntax, they have bad punctuation, they do everything, do you fix it up? Of course you fix it up. You're not, you're not going to send it out like, like that. You'll always fix it up because you, you want it to, to, to go out to reflect the way you think it should be. So, so Paul uh, so often worked in with Christians who were, who were ministering with him when he was writing letters. Now, a growing problem in church life it's people, it's, it's the, uh, we have people come from, from dysfunctional backgrounds and many of us have come from, from dysfunctional backgrounds where the devil has messed up how we were in earlier days and, and, uh, and ministering in a team for many people becomes a functional nightmare. But, and, and that dysfunctional background can create, can create an exaggerated need to be doing things and to be seen doing things and, and it can, unfortunately, create this thing where other people can't work in with us. And, and, uh, and most times, out of this dysfunctional background, uh, people push themselves in, in different ways, but then when they're in a, a place of ministry, they become prickly. Women, do you use the word prickly? You understand what a prickly person is? I remember um, coming down here, it was a, a ladies' meeting. Uh, it was many, many years back. It was a... a New Zealand lady ministering here. I don't remember her, her name now. But uh, I remember when she just waiting on God for who to call the, the uh, order call for. She said, there are people here who are really prickly. And I thought, oh, no one's going to answer this one. <laughs> and she kept pressing it and pressing it and pressing it. And then different ones began coming out, coming out, coming out. Because they knew that the Spirit of God was going after something in them. And, and, and that's the season, that's the time when we need to be, to be responsive. And, and, and then of course because of dysfunctional backgrounds we can be hurtful in our, our words and actions to those around us. And what, what happens is most churches are unwilling to correct this. And, and then you get into further problems because you've got people who no one can work in with and they finish up doing stuff by themselves and if anyone tries to come in and do what they've been doing, they have all kinds of hassles like all the fireworks go off at once. <laughs> How many remember Craig and I where you, you, you had, a, you, you had your, 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 your fireworks in a box or something and you had to be so careful that, that a match never got near it or a candle, nothing got uh, near it. And, and I, I think in church life we face something, something similar. But, but see, because, and, and, and most churches are saying, look, let's just let this go, and, and the person's prickly, and there are problems, and they can't work in with anyone, but, but you know, we'll sort of try to work it out, and, and you finish up with just no one being, being happy. And, and, and finishing up with, with, um, with what God is saying is I want people working in teeth so we have to work on the areas in us 
that, that, that makes us prickly or that makes us not a good team person. We, we have to be working on these things. And if we, we just push the ministry side, we never deal with these things. And then we wonder why, why things don't go the way that, that we, we had really wanted. Alright, so because the New Testament pattern was for serving others, ministering, to be invariably done in teams, we as a church have to pursue that practice. We have to be a people who pursue working in teams in terms of ministry. When there are clashes, rather than saying, well, the ministry comes first, no, no, your character comes first. And, and getting rid of those prickly rough edges comes before ministry. Because otherwise you finish up out there by yourself. So what I'm, what I'm saying, I'm telling you what's on the bus. And, and so uh, if this church is to be a base where Christians are disciple, trained to win and disciple others, then we have to be committed to having a common purpose, a common understanding of what we are here for. We have to be practicing spiritual discipline. We have to be serving others as part of a team. Uh, partly toward this end, but as this year comes to an end, we're not going to be continuing our Sunday night connect group. But we're going to beginning, be beginning a Sunday night meeting in place of that here, each Sunday night, that will have a very practical emphasis and it will be more interactive on training people to win others to Christ and to disciple them. Now, do I think the whole church was like, yes, this is what we've been waiting for? Yes. No. <laughs> But if we're going to do what we've been called to do, mm -hmm. we need to do something down this way. We need to do something down this way. So, so I guess just in this second last phase of my ministry as the leader of this church, this is the direction I want us to do. This is what's up on the bus. And I want you to just think through. Because people get this idea, oh, I've been in this church for a certain number of years. This is my church. And I can outlast any minister, any anything, including Jesus. No, you can't. Jesus lives forever. Amen. And the church is called to do what He's called it to do. Mm -hmm. and, and if you ask 38 people, Christians, what's the church meant to be doing? You'll get 38 shades of meaning. And so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that as long as I lead this church, these three points, I just want to move and try, try to do it graciously. Um, some of you will come willingly, some of you will come screaming blue murder. Uh, uh, but whichever way, I'm just, just wanting us to be more and more what God is wanting us to be. Amen. People who are personally disciple and who are able to win others to Christ and then disciple them. You're on the bus now. Stick on this bus. Amen. Going somewhere. Yes. And it's going to be a good end to the story. Musician, you come. We're going to close off just singing, This is 